this is the story of the return to Singapore and the Japanese unconditional surrender there. Some of the first of the occupation force to land were those famous Indian fighters, the Dogras, comrades of the men who first met the Japs in Malaya at Kota Baru in January 1942. Units of the RAF regiment were also early to land. It must have been a fine sight for the people of Singapore to see British and Empire troops in the streets of the city again after three and a half bitter years of occupation by Japan. For a short time, even now, a few Japanese guards were retained as a purely temporary police force while the first landings were going on. But that didn't last long. The release of our prisoners and internees was obviously a priority duty, and Japanese guards were made to remove barricades at prison camps as well as many other places on the island. As for the prisoners, well, we may have thought there's a cigarette famine here at home, but we haven't known the half of it. Reports of atrocities and ill-treatment followed thick and fast upon the liberation of Singapore. Here among the first authentic pictures is stark evidence of starvation and lack of medical treatment for sickness and disease. All the criminals responsible must be caught and punished. But thank heavens, there is also pictured evidence of another kind. In fact, in the great majority of the films so far received, our prisoners and internees appear to be in good shape, considering everything. The facts of the situation are far from complete, Indeed, many relatives still await news of husbands and sons. Although in this film we see only a few of almost 200,000 captives liberated by SIAC, most of them, here at Changi, for instance, appear to be in better health than was expected. And sooner than expected, Singapore had been reoccupied without the great assault which had been planned. The town was almost intact. Thousands of lives had been saved. And now the Supremo, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, was there in person to receive the surrender from the Japs. He enters the municipal building where the surrender is to be made. And here come the Japanese, General Itagaki and his crew of army and navy officers, who are marched along under strong guard and booed by the crowd. This is a picture we've all been waiting to see for a very long time. In they went, or rather were taken, to the appointed place and told where to stand. in his own time, Lord Louis entered and indicated that they could sit down. Here's an extract from what he told them. I have come here today to receive the formal surrender of all the Japanese forces within the Southeast Asia Command. I wish to make this plain. The surrender today is no negotiated surrender. The Japanese are submitting to superior force, now massed here. General Itagaki signed on behalf of Field Marshal Terauchi, who really was ill, Lord Louis had had that checked up. Itagaki had been reported as a fire eater, breathing defiance to the end, but he signed on the dotted line. Lord Louis's signature accepted the Japanese capitulation. More boos and jeers greeted Itagaki and co as they were marched away. Then the Supremo read his order of the day to the parade with thousands of the people of Singapore watching and listening. General Slim, that great British commander, was by his side. I wish you all to know the gratitude and the pride that I feel towards every man and woman in this command today. You beat the Japanese soldier in battle, inflicting six times the number of deaths that he was able to inflict on you, and you chased him out of Burma. The defeat of Japan last month is the first in history. For hundreds of years, the Japanese have been ruled by a small set of militarists, and they have been taught 
to look on themselves as a superior race of divine origin. They have been encouraged to be arrogant to foreigners and to believe that treachery such as they practice at Pearl Harbor is a virtue so long as it results in a Japanese victory. They are finding it very hard to accept defeat and they have not been too proud to try and wriggle out of the terms of their surrender. You may well find, therefore, that those Japanese who have a fanatical belief in their divine superiority and who feel that we are too soft to put them in their place will try and behave arrogantly. You are to stand no nonsense from these people. You will have my support in taking the firmest measures against any attempt at obstinacy, impotence, or non-cooperation. The ceremony wasn't yet complete. The Union Jack had still to be hoisted. This was the flag about which Lord Louis had already said. In 1942, the Japanese ordered that the Union Jack and a white flag should be carried through the streets of Singapore. In reply, a British officer explained that no Union Jack was available as all had been burnt. The Japanese accepted this explanation. The officer concerned retained this Union Jack in Changi, where it was used for funerals. It has been handed back to me for hoisting ceremoniously on this historic occasion. After the Supremo had called for three cheers for the king, he drove through vast Singapore crowds, Chinese, Malays, Indians and the rest, and I think we can all judge for ourselves as to the population's reaction to the return of peace, justice and freedom to the city and the island of Singapore, to Malaya and to all Southeast Asia. <laughs> 